Uh, welcome to Aviation United by Aviation Zorro. I'm delighted to welcome rocket scientist for Blue Origin, Project Possum scientist, and astronaut candidate, Joan Melendez Meisner. Uh, we're very well welcome, Joan. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm so delighted to be here, and thank you so much for having me. No, it's our pleasure. We've got to pretty much, uh, as we say, hit it. I think that's correct that the Blue Angels say. Yeah. Um, and start on and move on as as, as uh, we have a lot to chat about, chat about today. So tell us, Joe, when was the first time you actually fell in love with aviation or aerospace? What was that moment that that kind of the, the light bulb went off in the head that this is for you? So the moment that hit me was when I was a young child. Uh, my father was in the military, so we lived in a lot of Navy bases. So I was able to see a lot of air shows from my backyard. And I know uh, my father took me to an air show uh, in one of the bases, and I just completely fell in love. I fell in love with the atmosphere. I fell in love with um, the planes that I was able to see that day, whether they were static or in the air. And from then on, I just fell in love with aviation as a whole. So when you were in school, generally, I mean, was there was there any opportunities or um, when you started out in school, did you did you think, oh, you know, this this is what I want to do and and this is what I I I you know this is my future. Was was that your goal from a young age? So from a young age, um, I wanted to be an astronaut, and um, you know, I wanted to work in the space sector. But I fell in love with the aviation side because of the air shows. Um, and when I was in college, I was able to intern with uh, Naval Air Systems Command, which is uh, Department of the, of the Navy, and they specifically did avi on the aviation side. That's why they're Naval Air Systems Command. So from there, I was able to work on planes and actually being able to physically touch the planes to troubleshoot the planes. Um, being able to answer questions to the pilots or to the mechanics or the sailors, uh, that just made me fall in love with it even more. And I knew that after I graduated, I want to work in aviation so I can help, uh, you know, either design the next plane or at least help uh, fix those problems that we have. Um, and just being able to be the near the planes was absolutely amazing. So was, was there, I, I know you mentioned that with your, your father, was there opportunities aside from that, um, like within school and, and college itself, to to pursue this, this career or dream? Yes. Uh, so, you know, you didn't necessarily have to live in Navy bases to go to the air shows. Uh, they're usually open to the public. So anybody who's in school and who's interested in aviation, I definitely want, you know, I would advise for you to go see an air show because you get to talk to the pilots, you get to uh, ask them questions, uh, you know, specifically, I would see the Blue Angels because um, I lived on Navy bases, but, you know, sometimes I go to Air Force uh, stations and see the Thunderbirds. And so oh, wow. being able to talk, yeah, being able to talk to them, uh, you know, watching the them do the crazy maneuvers that they do, you know, Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds, they do some insane tricks. Uh, it just made me, you know, more enthusiastic to work for the aviation industry. And, you know, um, I specifically went the government route and, you know, did, uh, you know, work for the Navy. However, there are other opportunities for those who are interested in aviation while in school. They can have internships and, you know, Boeing, uh, GE, which does the engines, Rolls-Royce, who does the engines. There's so many companies out there, uh, Lockheed, that's doing right now the Joint Strike Fighter um, for the Navy, that you can intern for those companies, whether through, through it's your college, um, which they do have a lot of job fairs. A lot of those aerospace companies come to your college because they're looking for bright young, uh, you know, engineers or STEM uh, or people who are going in STEM because, you know, they, they want to invest their time in the future. So, you know, if you do a lot of these internships and they like you, then they offer you the job. They want to invest the time in you. And uh, the internship route is a, definitely a good way to get more, more exposure to the aerospace world. So for STEM, you mentioned STEM there, just for our listeners that don't actually know what STEM is, because I think it's more, um, it's probably more popular in, in the States side, but uh, around Europe and Asia, they wouldn't generally know. What, what is STEM? So STEM is just an acronym for Scientist, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Uh, sometimes you'll hear STEAM, which is Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. Uh, so it's just an acronym for those who are studying, you know, science, technology, engineering, math degrees. Uh, it's easier to, to just say the acronym STEM. Um, I don't know if we are around many of the military folks, but acronyms are life. So, you know, to shorten anything, they just put a label on it and they name it STEM. Right. Oh, okay. So in terms of the, the, the training that you went through, even in college, how, how difficult was the course? I mean, are we talking about, do you, a lot of effort involved or do you have, is it like natural ability or do you have to have a love of it 
to make it flow and and uh, succeed if that makes sense yeah it, it does um so you don't necessarily need natural ability you're, you're it's always good to have that natural ability and you know be able to be good at math from a very young age um but a lot of the folks like myself uh you know it, it took a lot of studying it took a lot of dedication but i knew that i wanted to graduate with a uh you know engineering and, and uh, scientist degree and so therefore i put in a lot of time and effort uh you know when a lot of folks at least in my friends who weren't uh pursuing the engineering degrees uh you know they would always invite me to parties and they'd invite me to do a lot of stuff but unfortunately because i wasn't a natural STEM person, I had to put in a lot of effort and have to miss a lot of that stuff so I can concentrate and make sure that I get passing grades. Uh, I still did have fun in college, but just probably not as much as other folks. All right. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's good to hear. <laughs> did, um, so how, how about financially? I mean, uh, the, the courses themselves or when you go to college, is there, is there financial support or are you, are you pretty much on your own that you, you must look after the, the, the college fees? Uh, so it's it's a little bit of both. Uh, what you want to do is uh, try to get grants or scholarships. So a lot of states offer scholarships right out of high school if you have a certain GPA um, and certain volunteer hours. And so, um, you know, some states offer either 75% tuition or 100% tuition. Unfortunately, Maryland did not have that, but there were grants that I did apply for. There's a whole bunch of grants for uh, engineering and science uh, students to help pay for college. And additionally, I was part of the Pathways program. So the Pathways program is really unique to the Department of Defense. And uh, how I got my job at NAVAIR as an intern is I applied to the Pathways program. And what that program does is it pays for your college the last two years of, um, you know, your junior and senior year. They pay for your books. Uh, sometimes they'll pay for your apartment or uh, food. And then at the same time, once they pay for all of that, you also have a guaranteed job within the Department of Defense. And so that I thought was outstanding. And I was offered the Pathways program. So, you know, I, I did have to get a lot of grants for the first couple of years, but because they paid for the last two years, it was a lot easier. All right. Okay. So, so Jenny, you mentioned there with um, the the hard work and dedication, which is required. I mean, what what what's the actual training like? Uh, so it's a lot of self training. Um, so I mean, if you're if you're going to school and you're you know you have all these physics courses, you have all these math and engineering and science courses. You know, the the teachers have you know maybe an hour to an hour and a half to teach you a week. And so a lot of the stuff you're kind of self-taught, you, you get to write notes of what the teacher is telling you, but at the same time, you have to do a lot of reading on your own. And if you're not understanding the material that well, uh, you would have to go uh, seek the help with tutors, whether they're usually um, upperclassmen or master students that put together study groups so you can you know, ask questions, do some problems. So there's a lot of opportunity, but a lot of the stuff is just self-motivated. You want to make sure that, you know, if you don't, if you're not getting the material, you can go to your professor, but there are all the other resources in the college to help you understand the material. So you're not really on your own, but you kind of are. You just got to be self-motivated to ask. Okay. So, so was there any point when you actually said during this training um, or during college, you ever said, oh, okay, this, this is not for me. Or were you so motivated because you've, you've, you've grown up in this environment that you said, no, no matter what, I'm determined to, to get through this? Or was there any little blips that you said, oh, I don't know, this might not be for me? So I don't know if you've ever taken organic chemistry, but that class almost broke me. It was it was a really hard class that I just was not getting um, the material. And I did a lot of self-help. And, you know, at, at the time, I kind of doubted myself thinking, OK, am I am I good enough to pursue this degree and keep going? But um, it was my love for, you know, space and the aerospace industry and knowing that, you know, having this degree and having uh, this, tra this college training is going to get me one step closer to working for designing a rocket or helping fix an airplane, being close to what I want. So even though uh, the class was really hard and it almost broke me, my self-motivation kept me going saying, you know, I have a longer goal and I want to achieve that goal. So I need to give it my all in order to pass. Right. OK. Well, you're obviously very determined. I have to say there was a photograph um, we've seen in your social media 
if any of the listeners out there, uh, you can catch up with Joan, uh, your female engineer. I think you're on, you're on, is it TikTok, Joan, is it? And Facebook, Instagram? Yes, Twitter, all those. Yes, I am. So you, you can catch her out there, but she has some really wonderful photographs. There's one there which I'm kind of jealous of myself, which is with the Blue Angels. Did you get to fly with the Blue Angels? No, I know, I didn't get to fly with the Blue Angel, but I work. Um, so I, I used uh, one of the places that I work for the Navy is a, a depot. So uh, usually when because they're performing such high G and uh, very demanding moves, uh, their plane would have to go down for maintenance a lot because we want to make sure that they're safe when they're performing a lot of these moves. So that goes through our Jacksonville facility, Jacksonville, Florida. All of the planes go there to get maintenance done, to get checks. And uh, I saw the plane and I got to meet the pilot. And, you know, a lot of people were, were kind of nervous to ask if they could sit in the cockpit. But I'm one of those people that you need to ask. And the, the worst they can say is no. Yes. So, um, yeah, I asked and the, the pilot was just super excited that I asked and let me go up and sit in the cockpit. Um, you know, we talked about what I did and what I'm doing to help him and his plane. Um, and then I told him that I was going to run away with the airplane once I got my pilot license. So he needs to watch out because I want a backseat ride. So hopefully I'll be able to take him up on his offer on that. <laughs> it, it is amazing. You have to the G. There's a lot of videos, as I'm sure you know, that are on YouTube um, of, of the Blue Angels specifically. And, and even myself, the, my favorite part is when you see them lining up on the runway. And they, they, they lift the nose slightly, they increase the speed, and then all of a sudden then uh, they, they, they say the famous words, hit it. And then they just pull extreme Gs. It's just, it's, it's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I was actually lucky enough to, I did have a backseat ride on an F-18. It wasn't necessarily the Blue Angel, but it was um, a test uh, F-18 that we had to test because of, you know, certain issues. And so I kind of weaseled my way and said, Hey, you need an engineer in the back seat to <laughs> collect all of this data. I, I just completely, you know, like was just talking out, um, you know, and I was hoping that they would let me do it. And I, I think I convinced them enough to say that, uh, to, to let me do it. And I was able to get a backseat ride um, when I was up in Maryland and that was in it, you know, the pilot, what they want to do is whenever they have an engineer in the backseat, all they want to do is want to make them throw up. So, you know, I told them from the very beginning, I was like, look, you know, I don't want to throw up. I really want to have a good experience. Um, at one point, I almost did once he uh, did a sharp turn. It was I pulled a lot of G's and I, I almost passed out. But thank God I didn't. It was it was a great experience. Well, I'm so, I'm so jealous. I'm sure other, our listeners are jealous as well. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to, to even have, it's just something so romantic about the F-18. And I think with the new movie um, uh, coming oh, out, yeah. shortly, Maverick, I think it's the end of the yep. year, isn't it? So uh, a lot, the, the specific, yeah, so Top Gun, the one that you're talking about, I think it's Top Gun 2, Maverick. Um, so a lot of the engineers in Maryland, where I used to work, is uh, Patuxent River, Maryland, uh, had a lot of, um, insight into the movie. So a lot of the cameras that are used in the cockpit, uh, they were done by engineers up in Nav Air. Uh, the test pilot school that I think they filmed a couple scenes in was in Patuxent River, Maryland. So it was really cool and neat to see that, you know, this film that I grew up with, you know, I watched Top Gun when I was little. Um, now they're doing the second portion of it was filmed uh, and used a lot of our engineers for a lot of the equipment that was used on board the F-18. It's amazing. I think that's probably one of the most iconic movies that pretty much got a lot of people into aviation. Yeah. Because of that movie. It's, it's, yeah. uh, I know we sidetracked there, but anyway, uh, it's <laughs> sidetracked something that's, that's uh, like Top Gun and, and the Blue Angels. It's, uh, these guys are amazing. So oh, I could uh, talk for days. <laughs> we could, we could talk about this forever. Like, but it's kind of um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is uh, for your, for yourself, John, at the moment is that, I mean, the amazing thing is how did you get the opportunity to work uh, for Blue Origin? So I, I still pinch myself um, knowing that I have a job there because, you know, thousands of people would apply to go to Blue Origin. Uh, and even though we, we're currently hiring a lot of people, we've hired about 300 in the last month and a half, even through COVID. Um, it's the interview process is still very grueling. It's very long. And um, I, I still don't understand how I was out of, you know, thousands of resumes, but they like something on my resume. And um, you know, the interview process is a three-part interview process. So the first one, the recruiter who looked at your resume and thought you were a good fit for the job will call you and we'll talk for about 30 minutes and say, hey, you know, 
how's life? How did you learn about Blue Origin? Why do you want to work here? The very typical interview questions. Uh, if they like you, then you go to a second phone interview, which is with a, the actual hiring manager. That one's a little bit more technical. So they start to dive into your resume and specifically ask you about projects that they think would benefit uh, in the role that you're applying to. And then the last interview, if you're not already winded with those two, is an in-person interview. And um, that one consists of an hour-long presentation about yourself, about your experience, about your college, um, your work experience. You have to uh, pick about one or two projects that you really want to deep dive, and they can ask you very technical questions on it. Uh, so even after you do an hour-long presentation with a whole bunch of hiring managers, you go straight into one-on-one 30-minute -on -one interviews with those managers. So you don't even get a break. You have to you know, be on your game all day. Uh, they talk about technical. They talk about um, you know, the culture at Blue Origin, and it's, it's back and forth. Um, and then after all of that, um, you know, they, they'll let you know if you got the position. So how uh, you know, I got started at Blue Origin is uh, last year, I, I went to a NASA social, and it was a demo one launch back in February of last year. And I told myself, OK, I was, you know, I've been in the aviation world for a long time. I want to now move over to the, the space sector because it's a very exciting time to move to the space sector with all the stuff that's happening with Moon 2024 and so on. Uh, so I applied to a lot of positions, uh, ULA, SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, NASA, Lockheed, and Northrop. And I got job offers in almost every single one of them. But the one that, um, you know, kind of caught my eye the most was Blue Origin because of their culture. So because, um, you know, I'd go into SpaceX, I'd go into all these other companies, and I felt very, um, I guess I don't understand how to describe it, but it, I just felt more of like a, a number versus, okay. uh, you know, being part of the family. But as soon as I walked into Blue Origin, it was from, you know, the receptionist who was trying to calm me down saying, you're going to do great to each one of the managers who were really interested in what I did versus, oh, you're not smart enough to be here or, you know, anything. I never felt that I wasn't smart enough or good enough to be at Blue Origin. They wanted to make sure that I was a good fit, not only technically, but also the personality. Um, everyone there is extre extremely friendly, extremely open. They all want to make it to space. We all want to be astronauts. Um, but, you know, it's just the culture there just felt more homey. It felt more like a family versus any other location. So that's why I really like Blue Origin. That's great. No, it's, it's, I think I'd love Blue Origin as well. I don't, I don't think many people would love Blue Origin. I think you, you, yeah. you, you, you've, you've advertised it very, very well. It's, um, what's it like? I mean, what's it like working as a rocket scientist there? I mean, oh. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, I, uh, you know, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, so a lot of people know Orlando, Florida for Disney and Universal and all the theme parks, um, but it's about 30 to 35 minutes out from the Space Coast. So, you know, growing up in Orlando, I was able to go to the Space Coast a lot and watch launches. I was able to watch launches from my backyard. Um, I'd go to field trips to the Kennedy Space Center uh, Visitor Center. So I got exposed to space real quick. Um, and I knew that I, you know, I always wanted, I always wanted to be an astronaut, but, you know, the probability of becoming an astronaut was such a small probability. So in my thought, I thought the best way to, you know, be close to the space, space sector is to be an engineer or a rocket scientist working on those shuttles, working on those space vehicles that would take astronauts to space. Because at least I would feel like I was, um, you know, contributing to space even if I wasn't going to space. So, you know, working as a rocket scientist is really cool because, you know, every single day is, it's, it's new and it's, it's exciting, um, especially with Blue Origin because the, the rocket that I'm currently working on, which is the New Glenn, is the orbital rocket for Blue Origin. And it's, uh, I don't know if you're a huge space nerd, but the Saturn V was the tallest rocket, it was one of the biggest rockets, and I think it was at 110 meters. Ours is at 98 meters tall, okay. so it was it's it's slightly lower than uh, the Saturn V, but it it overshadows any space vehicle that's being used right now. So the Falcon, the Atlas, uh, the future Vulcan, um, it's it's going to be way taller than all of those. So you know, being able to be there at the ground floor, what, designing the rocket, being able to go to the launch pad and help build the launch pad up to to eventually launch our rocket is exciting and every single day I pinch myself <laughs> thinking that I can't believe that I have such a great job. Is, 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 the, is the excitement building up now uh, for the 27th of May? 
for the, the launch. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And so the, the cool thing about um, space is, you know, there, there's always competition between, you know, Blue Origin, SpaceX, Boeing, ULA, but at the end of the day, we're all cheerleaders for every single space company. So our, our, our manufacturing plant is right outside Kennedy Space Center. So, you know, we have a balcony that oversees or, or overlooks uh, all the launch pads. So whenever there's a launch, every single person at Blue Origin is on that balcony watching, you know, SpaceX launch or ULA or any of the other companies. And so this uh, May 27th launch is gonna be a big one. It's gonna be very exciting. And I can't wait uh, to go to the balcony at Blue Origin and watch it launch because it's been over a decade. And, I, um, you know, I, again, growing up in Orlando, I was able to see the shuttle program from the start to finish. So it was, uh, it's very exciting to be able to send astronauts from that Kennedy Space Center again. It's almost been a decade. It's such an achievement. It really is. And I think, I think the excitement will build, um, especially now, because um, I think the focus is most people are now staying at home. Um, yes. they get a wonderful opportunity now to uh, see the launch on the 27th. So yes, I'm very excited, and I'm sure our listeners are, and you are. So it's a but let, let's kind of let's get to the knowledge part of it now, the technical stuff, Joan. So for the listeners, and try keep it as simple as possible. Keep it at my level, very simple. Um, how fast does a rocket travel? So say from the launch part uh, to the stages as you progress through the atmosphere. What speeds are we talking about? So in order for a rocket to launch and make it into space, you need to get to the orbital velocity, which right now it's about approximately five miles per second okay. in order for a rocket to go into space. And if, if, you, if you think of the sheer magnitude of how fast that is, it's about 20 times the speed of sound. Wow. So if you're looking at, you know, you think speed of sound is extremely fast, you know, we have to be, be even faster to break that sound barrier for that rocket to go into space. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of propellants, there's a lot of the stuff that goes into the rocket, there's a lot of engines uh, that go at the bottom of the rocket. Um, for each stage, there's engines, there's different stages. Uh, so ours on the New Glenn, there's the first stage, which I think holds about six engines. And then um, you also have the second stage, which has two engines, and then the payload, which doesn't have anything because it's attached to the second uh, stage. And so, you know, to, to, to be that fast, you have to, you know, have the right mixture of propellants, whether it's liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, gaseous uh, oxygen, hydrogen, all these other propellants that's going to help you achieve that, you know, close to five miles per second in order to, to go to space. So, Joan, did you have any uh, mentors uh, growing up through college or school or even throughout your training? Absolutely. I think mentorship is extremely important to get you to where you want to be. I had a lot of guidance counselors when I was in college. And even when I got a job, my first job, I never stopped getting mentors. I always had mentors for my career. I had a mentor just for, um, you know, learning how to play piano even more. I had different mentors for different things. Uh, one specific mentor that I want to mention, which I thought is really cool and really exciting is, um, so I met this F-18 pilot when I was volunteering, uh, when I worked at in Maryland, in Patuxent River, Maryland, and we hit it off pretty well because we both would show up to these volunteer sessions. And what it is, is um, ele elementary school kids from around the area would come to the base and we would launch rockets with them. We would do science experiments. Uh, we do flight simulators with them. So, you know, she'd always show up and we started hitting it off. Um, so I asked, you know, if, if I could, if I, if she could be my mentor, because at the time I wanted to get my private pilot license. So, you know, getting uh, a mentor that can guide me through that process was great. Um, long story short, she actually is now an astronaut, a NASA astronaut. Her name is Nicole Mann. Wow. And she got selected uh, to be an astronaut candidate, uh, not last round, but the round before. She's going to be uh, going on the Boeing Starliner. And so she's currently a NASA astronaut, but working alongside with Boeing. Uh, so she's a really cool person. Uh, so look her up. She was one of my mentors. And, you know, that's, that's why I say mentors are very important because, you know, they, they can get you to, they can give you advice on your career. They can give you advice on so many different subjects. And you never know when your mentor is going to end up. And so it's, it's always neat and always a positive outcome. 
personally, like you, you, you have um, this wonderful passion for aviation aerospace. Outside of it, is there any other passions that you have, or is it just aviation is 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 a thing? So uh, I also have uh, music as a passion. So when I was in when I was younger, I learned to play the clarinet and the saxophone. So I'm really into music. Um, I used to be in the in high school and college. I was in the band for clarinet and saxophone. And if, if you're not really familiar with that, um, I was first chair, which I'm, I'm kind of giving you how nerdy I am. So first chair <laughs> is <laughs> it's a really high honor because, uh, you know, you're you're the lead. You get all the solos. And so, you know, you have to audition to get the specific chair placement. So, you know, I was. I, I practice really hard and I, yeah, I love playing the clarinet and um, I'd always get first chair, which was, you know, outstanding and awesome achievement. Um, but then I also picked up the piano. So I love playing the piano now a little bit more than the, uh, the clarinet, just because it's, um, it's very calming. So whenever I'm stressed out, I just put up the piano, learn a new song and, you know, dedicate all of my effort to that and not really think about, you know, any stresses that's coming my way. I just think about learning that song. So, you know, my other passion is music, absolutely. And then um, I also like photography. Oh, I got wow. into photography about two two years ago. Um, I had a coworker who owned a photography business, a wedding photography business. And, um, you know, he, he would teach me how to take photos. And then I became his uh, second photographer whenever there, there was weddings. So I learned the ins and outs of photography and videography. And what I do now is whenever I travel, well, whenever we can travel again with my <laughs> husband, um, you know, I take my professional camera and I'm able to take really nice landscape pictures. So when I come back, I can edit the pictures and, you know, have a really nice memory of me and my husband at, you know, this location, instead of taking uh, camera pictures on your phone, even though the phone cameras are getting a lot better and a lot more um, resourceful with, uh, you know, the wide angles being added to them, you know, maybe in the future, the camera will have everything, even the nice camera. Um, you know, lenses on those. But yeah, I would say the, the other two passions that I have is photography and music. And it's, um, so what, would, what, what advice then, John, would you give anyone wanting to join uh, the aviation or aerospace industry, especially from a young age, so to speak? Because a lot of us, you do see the Hollywood style of, as we mentioned, you know, Top Gun, and it looks very glamorous. But what, 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 would, what advice would you give them um, if they're wanting to join the industry? So there is a lot of dedication um, behind the scenes that Hollywood doesn't show you. There's a lot of time and effort that you have to put to your craft. So if you want to be uh, an engineer for an aerospace company, then you have to put yourself in situations that'll get you to towards that. So not only do you have to get the degree, but you also have to get those internships to get you exposure to the aerospace companies or the, or the space companies if you want to go directly to that. Um, you know, the, the benefit about that is a lot of those companies do hire a lot of interns for the summer and, you know, the winter breaks and stuff like that. So you have a lot of opportunities in all of these companies to try to intern and get that experience. So when you graduate, you can be that much better and that much ahead on others who did not have internships. So you have the experience um, prior to even landing a job. Uh, the other thing that I would that I would advise is um, don't give up. I know that you know that that's usually a very cliche thing to say, um, but I truly believe that because you know I try to get a job at NASA. I think I applied to five or six positions last year, and each every single one of them I never got that interview. And so you know there's there's points where I said, well maybe I'm not I'm not good enough to be in the space sector just yet. That I need that experience. But the thing was, is it wasn't that I was missing the experience. It's just I, there was someone else that had better experience or wasn't a better fit for that position. I right. essentially did get a job at NASA, um, and you know, it kind of made, it made me feel a lot better just because you know it kind of gave me that confidence back. But you know, if if it, if I stopped right there after you know the fourth or fifth rejection, I may not have a job. You know, at Blue Origin, or I may have not gotten the job offer from NASA. Um, so it's just, you have to keep grinding, you have to keep applying, you have to dedicate your time um, to learning your craft. So if you want to be an engineer, you're not understanding the material, it's okay. 
a lot of people don't. You just put that much effort to learning the material so you can pass and move to the next chapter. Is, is there any subject you'd recommend, um, uh, you know, uh, people to our students to focus on? I know, I know you mentioned before uh, organic uh, chemistry, but like is maths, do you have to be very strong at maths or is like a balance? Are they looking for the whole package? Yeah, so it, it kind of depends on what kind of degree you want. Um, what we all have in common is the math. So you take all the calculuses, you even go beyond calculus to differential equations, To you take a whole bunch of math, you take a lot of physics. So I would suggest to you know get comfortable with math and physics. Um, the organic chemistry part is only for those who are trying to get a degree in chemical engineering or chemistry. Uh, so someone who's in aerospace or mechanical engineering may not may not really take those classes. Theirs might be more uh, dynamics or statics to learn the you know the the truances and stuff of uh, the mechanical side of things. So therefore, you know, they may not see organic chemistry. But the things that we have in common across all of the degrees is definitely math and physics. Right. Which I'm I was well even now I'm hopeless at and rubbish <laughs> and I think. Uh, I think there's no point. I think I don't think Blue Origin or NASA would, would, would look at me because of that. But then again, a few years, I turned the clock back a little bit. Maybe if I took time to study a bit harder, maybe. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, when you first get out of college, they, they definitely look at your transcripts. But once you start working uh, in the industry for a long time or, or for you get some experience under their belt, they look more at your experience uh, over your grades, which is it's good, um, you know, because you know, so those who excelled and got 4.0, which is, you know, getting A's all along, um, they may have easier opportunity to get the jobs that they want versus someone who was on the lower end. But at the same time, you went through the exact same courses, you both passed, um, you know, I, I always tell people to not compare yourself to other people, because each one of us are, are in our own different paths. So my path led me to the space industry Eight, eight years after I started working, um, others land a job in the space industry um, a lot sooner. So I never try to compare myself because we each have our own path and I just try to enjoy my journey and I try to do what I personally can to get to where I'm going. Yeah, well, I think, I think I mean, from, from our side as well here, um, I mean, you, you do a lot. You can see it even on your social media there with, and, and People are so interested and you really do inspire and you motivate, especially the younger ones. And you can see that. And it's it's a, it's a great credit to you, John. So keep doing what you're doing. That's all we oh, can thank say. you. So tell us, what about any funny stories you've had throughout your career or your training? Um, so let's see. What, what's the most bizarre uh, thing that ever happened? What's the most craziest uh, thing? Let's forget about the college years when when all, all the partying aside. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, or the lack of partying. Right. That's um, so. <laughs> So I, I have a lot of cool stories that I can tell. Um, one of the, the neatest ones that I could say, you know, we already talked about the F-18 uh, backseat ride, but the other one was I was able to go on a Navy carrier uh, for about six to seven days out at sea um, as an engineer uh, working out there uh, with the sailors. So, you know, I got to experience what it was like to be a Navy officer um, because they let us stay in the officer quarters. Um, but the cool thing about that story was I was able to see a lot of the night ops. So, you know, the, the landings of the F-18s on the carrier, we got to see that during the day, but the nighttime is just that much better. It's just so neat to see them land on a carrier, um, the traps get them, and um, also catapult off the carrier is always neat to see. So, you know, I, that experience is always something that I keep with me uh, because there's not a lot of people that are going to experience that. And, you know, I don't take that for granted. And um, the other thing about the Navy carriers, I was actually, um, because the carrier had to stay out at sea and we were done with our job, uh, we got catapulted off the carrier. Oh, wow. So that was pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah, so it was pretty intense. It's like, um, I don't know if you've ever been on a roller coaster, but a roller coaster, you go from like zero to 60 in two seconds or something like that. Um, so this was kind of, it was pretty much the exact same thing, except um, if the roller coaster went backwards because you were facing the opposite direction that you were being catapulted. And um, funny story about that is there was a sailor that, you know, all of us were, we were called civvies, which is our civilians and not military. Right. So they would call us civvies. And, um, you know, the, there's one sailor who, who's there obviously to scare you. 
And so, you know, he's strapping us on and he's like, hey, don't have anything in front of you because, you know, the last person that was on here, the last baby that wrote, uh, did this catapult, you know, she was trying to record herself and the phone got off her hand and it smacked her in the face and it broke her jaw. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, was, I was like the whole time I'm like holding tight to like my phone and everything, making sure that I'm not being that idiot who's going to break a jaw, you know, on a catapult. But um, no, it actually never happened. But it's just a story that they tell, you know, people just get them scared. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, that was a really cool experience of, you know, being able to go on a carrier and then being able to be, uh, catapulted off. Um, the other uh, neat experience. How did that feel, Joe? I mean, what was it like? Was it, was it a lot of pressure on your body? Um, so I, I, I got a lot of more pressure when I was on the F-18, um, because of the G's. No, this one, it just, it literally felt like I was, I was on a roller coaster and it went from zero to 60, no pressure at all. It's just, you know, you kind of, you, you put your arms out and they're just waving out in, in the, in the space. And then in less than two seconds, you're back to normal. And then it was a, a very uncomfortable, a very uncomfortable hour and a half plane ride back because the plane is, uh, there's only two windows. So everything was super dark. And so you're just kind of like in the dark and you're smelling fuel. And so it was a very uncomfortable hour and a half. So it was like two seconds of pure joy and then an hour and a half of being <laughs> uncomfortable in the plane. So there, there, there was a clip, I think, I know we're going back now to, we're going back to, to Maverick now, or Top Gun, but it just when you mentioned that story, there was a clip, I think, the, the latest trailer was with uh, Tom Cruise, and he was being catapulted, I think, off one yep. of the naval ships as well. Yep. Um, he's a very brave man. Yes, yeah. He word. actually, I don't know if you've heard about this, but he wants to make the first movie in space. So he's working with NASA and SpaceX to film a movie in space in the ISS. Oh, wow. So not only was he, you know, on an F-18 and got to experience that, but he might be the first like actor to go to space and film a movie up there. So he's, he's a, he's a brave man. <laughs> it's amazing though. I mean, but he probably have to go through all the training as well, won't he? Oh, definitely. I mean, he had to do a lot of the training for the F-18. So, you know, one of the trainings that you had to take to even be on the backseat is um, called survival training. And so, you know, they, they do a epoxy on you. Um, they're, they're essentially training you for a worst case scenario. So, you know, you're sitting in a seat and they kind of, um, they do an ejection seat. So you just go up maybe like six feet, but you go up really quickly. Um, you have to hang and, um, you know, have a parachute behind you so you can see, so you can feel the, the weight of how heavy it is. Uh, the other thing that they do, which was, I think this part of this training that scared me the most was uh, it's called the Dunker training. So they have a replica of a cock or of a of a helicopter, and so what they do is they dunk you into the pool, and then they flip the helicopter upside down. So you're already strapped. You're upside down. You have to get out of the strap and uh, escape from just the one window that they're telling you to escape. Oh, that wow. part wasn't that part wasn't scary to me. The part that scared me um and I don't get scared very easily <laughs> is um they did the exact same thing but you had uh goggles that were dark so you oh. couldn't see so you were blinded so right. you had to you you didn't know when you were going to go underwater you just felt it going underwater you couldn't tell when you could take your last breath um so everything was just dark everything you're essentially blind um and then you still had to feel your way to go out that one window so it was you know that was the part that I was a little iffy on, but you know, I'm pretty sure that Tom Cruise had to do that exact same training um, to do the F-18. And does it take long? Is on, on average, I mean, uh, would it take long to train to fly the F-18 in general? Oh, in general, yeah, several several years. Um, you know, a lot of them are they 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 have to go through ground school, so it's kind of similar to getting your private pilot license, but it's a little bit more intense. So you go through ground school, then you have to go through a lot of flight simulators. Um, and, you know, our, our team also helped with the flight simulators as well. So it was that, that was really cool. So you go, you have to log in a lot of hours for your flight simulator. Then you have to log in hours in the sky. Um, and then after that, you have to do qualifications out at sea. So you have to land on a carrier. So it, it's a lot of training to become an F-18 pilot. It's pretty intense, isn't it? It is very intense. Yeah, I had a friend um, who was also an engineer, but he joined. I think it was the Coast Guard. So now he is um, a pilot, 
for the Coast Guard. And, uh, you know, he would post on social media all of the stuff, all the training that he had to go through. And it was, it was crazy. And it took him, I think, uh, a year and a half to officially graduate and uh, be a pilot. Wow. Okay. So there's a lot of work involved as well. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of work and a lot of schooling during it well, as well. Right. But well, this this next question is pretty much my question is is and it's a little bit off script so to speak. But have you ever been to the buoyancy uh, where the astronauts get dunked in water and they they perform their their duties as if they're in space? Have you ever been to that? I have not been to it. Um, however, I am currently a finalist to be a net, uh, be in a research analog mission. So that's called the it's called the NASA HERA, and HERA stands for Human Exploration uh, Research Analog. And so what it is, it's they take about four to six candidates, uh, I think once a year. It's a 45-day mission, and you're in a, a three-story habitat that's supposed to mimic the International Space Station. So you go in there. Uh, not only are they testing isolation, they're test, they're, um, you're also working, doing science experiments. You're essentially doing the same thing that you would do in the ISS, except you're you have gravity, right? You're not floating around. Um, so the cool thing about that is if I get selected, I'll be able to tour uh, the Johnson Center, the NASA Johnson Center, where the buoyancy lab is. So I'll be able to see uh, the buoyancy lab and hopefully be able to, um, I can maybe ask and, you know, the worst they can say is no, but, you know, maybe experience some of that while I'm down there. Oh, yeah. What you do is you, you tell them what you told on the F-18, Yep, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be a future astronaut anyway, so I'm, you know, might as well just start now. <laughs> that's it. You, you got to do it. Well, well, Joan, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It's um, uh, your journey into aviation and aerospace is amazing. Um, I mean, the explanations you've given, the hard work which is involved, um, it really is great uh, for the younger uh, listeners to hear this as well that it is it is achievable if you, if you put the work and the effort in as mentioned before uh joan has your female engineer she's on all the social media uh, she has some wonderful photographs uh some cool videos you do experiments in your videos joan is that correct i do yes and is there any i mean what's the coolest one you'd probably uh you have done so far I think the coolest one that I've done um, was actually related to COVID-19. So it's a really simple experiment where you take a cup of water, you put it up on a plate, uh, you spray or you pour pepper on it. And, um, you know, you, you put your finger in the middle of the plate, nothing happens. It's as if the pepper is just floating around. Um, but if you put a little bit of soap on your finger and then you di dip it into the water, uh, the pepper goes towards the outside. And so that's supposed to simulate, you know, um, not only the importance of washing your hands through COVID-19, um, but, you know, it's, it's just a really simple explanation that you could tell your, your kids and you can show uh, anybody in class and it really doesn't take that much material. So a lot of the experiments that I try to do is I try to do experiments that you can find with household items. So you don't have to you know, go out and buy some chemical that you can't really get unless you work at a chem lab. A lot of the stuff is just in under your sink um, or, you know, somewhere around the house that you can do the experiments. And is that, do you have them on uh, TikTok, is it? I do. I have them on TikTok. And then I also have a Facebook page for your female engineer. Uh, so either or if you want to see it on TikTok or if you want to follow your female engineer on Facebook, I have the videos on there as well. And people can, con uh, can contact you directly? Yes. Yes, they can contact me directly. Um, either, you know, I, I, I use Messenger a lot on, on all of the apps. So if you ever have questions or if you have experiments that you want me to do, I'm more than happy to hear. And I'm also there to ask or answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. I'll tell you what it is, John, is that I actually said goodbye to you already, but I want to talk to you more. But <laughs> you're, 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 um, uh, you're busy as well. You have, a lot, you have a lot to do. But again, thank you so much. And uh, I'm sure our listeners will, um, will be in touch with you very, very shortly. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited to uh, you know, be able to share my story and hopefully it inspires any, some people to go into aviation and pursue their dreams. Thank you. Thank you.